Thank you for joining us this Resurrection Sunday. We know that right now with the coronavirus, things are a little different than we normally have, uh, but we appreciate you tuning in and watching us online. We do pray that when we are able to meet again, that you will come and join us in person, and we look forward to that day. But in the meantime, uh, we appreciate you tuning in. We pray that this would be a great Resurrection Sunday for you, where you can celebrate all the life that Christ brings. I would invite you to connect with us if you have any needs during this time. Uh, you can email us at help at bethelsi.org, and uh, we can see what we can do to help you in, this, in the midst of this coronavirus that's going on. Again, you can email us at help at bethelsi.org. If you have any prayer requests during the broadcast today, uh, you can fill those in on the comments. Remember, those are public comments, uh, so be, please be careful in what you post. Uh, but we want to be praying for you about whatever is going on. And so thank you again for tuning in, and we look forward to meeting you again in person. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Uh, yeah, it's a little different when people are here and uh, they can respond with that. I know this Easter is very different. Our girls were uh, asking to wear their Easter dresses so that they can come to the television in the living room and be dressed in their Easter dresses so they can watch the sermon online. Uh, so things are, are very different. Uh, but what is still the same is that our Savior is risen from the dead. And so we celebrate that this Easter Sunday morning. Uh, some have suggested that this may be the worst Easter ever. Uh, we, but anytime we can come together and we can celebrate the fact that Jesus has raised from the dead and is risen today, we can celebrate that. So we can celebrate the worst Easter ever because we had the first Easter ever. And so that is a great cause of celebration. Uh, that Resurrection Sunday, uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, that is what we want to celebrate this morning. Uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty in the world around us right now, uh, this might be the closest that we have ever been to the actual thinking and the emotions that the disciples felt on that first Easter morning. Uh, when they knew that Jesus was dead, that he was buried, and just some of the uncertainty that they felt, that's also something that we are feeling as well, this time of uncertainty. Uh, there was a time when Jesus told them, told his disciples that they would all fall away because of him. And if you remember, there was a very outspoken Peter who adamantly denied that fact. He said, even if everybody else falls away, then I will never deny you. And we read later that Peter denied Jesus three times. Uh, we read that even a servant girl who accused Peter of being with Jesus, that she made that accusation and Peter again denied Jesus. And so what Jesus had said came true. And so there was a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty that the disciples are feeling this time when uh, they know that Jesus has been crucified, he's been buried, but they don't know about the resurrection just yet. So the disciples at this time are, are fearful. They're confused. The rabbi that they had been following for three years, he's now dead. Uh, he was buried in a tomb. Uh, they thought that he was the Messiah. They thought that he was God's anointed one. And now he's dead. So clearly, in their minds, they had misunderstood. There's no way that the Lord's Messiah would be dead without accomplishing God's plan. These disciples had, had left their jobs to follow Jesus. And with Jesus dead, now they have to admit that Maybe they misunderstood. Maybe they followed the wrong rabbi. The disciples had questions. They were looking for answers, but they didn't know where to turn. And so we know from our looking back on these events that the disciples completely misunderstood God's plan and God's purpose for sending the Messiah. In their minds, they thought they knew what God was doing. They thought they understood God's plan. But in reality, their eyes were blinded. Many churches are worshiping online this morning. Uh, we are doing church in a way that was never expected. There are some churches that have very large Easter productions. Uh, these plans have been in place for over a year as they were planning for Easter of 2020. And now they're not able to follow through 
on those very large plans that they had made. There are pastors who were preaching through series, going and in, in pointing to the anticipation of this Easter Sunday morning. And they've had to change their plans because of how we're celebrating the resurrection today. There are also other churches that have their largest crowds of the year on Easter Sunday, and pastors are preaching to empty churches, at least empty church buildings, because everything is online. As this coronavirus has spread, the the nation is under the stay-at-home order. Uh, Everyone is realizing that this Easter is going to be different than other Easter's we've had before. As long-term plans get scrapped and as plans are rushed together, how are we going to celebrate the resurrection this Easter Sunday? And that is why I think that this this Easter is teaching us to relate to the disciples more than any Easter that we've had before. Uh, The disciples' hopes, their plans are gone. And churches today are experiencing all of their plans being scrapped right now as well. Uh, The churches are experiencing a lot of uncertainty. Well, that's the disciples. They are experiencing fear and uncertainty as their Messiah, their rabbi, has died. And so while the disciples are forced into hiding, the churches today are meeting in their homes because of these stay-at-home orders. But just as God's plan was far bigger than what the disciples could ever imagine, I think that God's plan for the churches today is far greater than we could ever imagine as well. Today, more people will be attending church virtually than ever before. We have people that are looking for answers. People that never would have been stepping into a physical church building, they're watching online to hear the hope and the life that is presented through the churches. They are hoping to hear something that will change their life and give them peace and comfort in this time right now. So there is a world that is out there looking for hope. So far, we've uh, seen where Bible sales have uh, really skyrocketed during this time. So in America, right now, Bible sales are are better than they've been. Uh, Lifeway reports that right now they are having a 62% increase of Bible sales this year over last year. Uh, One in five non-Christians said that this crisis is causing them to look to the Bible for answers. And they are listening to Christian teaching, hoping to hear the hope and the life that the church presents. This week I listened to a podcast. Uh, Their church was giving some ideas of how to celebrate Easter in an online community. And uh, this church in Florida has been continuing to do baptisms, even though they're stay-at-home orders. They've been uh, guiding people through how to do baptisms with their family in their backyard pools. And so they've been live streaming these baptisms uh, for their church body to celebrate baptism and the life change that comes in Christ. And one of these families that was being baptized, uh, they were live streaming the service to the church. Well, they had family in Boston that tuned in and listened to the testimony of how a person's life was changed. And this family member in Boston gave their life to Christ as a result of hearing the testimony and seeing someone follow through in baptism. That's something that never would have happened before. We don't live stream baptism very often. And so this family member just happened to turn in, tune in that day. And that's because God had a plan to use this coronavirus for something far greater than we could ever imagine. Imagine if this church had given up on baptisms, just said, hey, you know what, we're not going to do that. We're not even going to try to find a way to do it. We'll just wait. But because they adapted to the situation, they were able to broadcast their, their baptisms and a person's life is now changed for eternity because of that. Uh, We did our Good Friday service online, uh, something very unusual, and uh, really it it misses a lot when you have to do it online. But I heard from other people that haven't been connected to Bethel for some time, and they're saying how much they enjoyed being able to participate, even if it's online, they've been able to participate with us in that Good Friday service. And so it is is a change, but yet God is using it for his glory and for his good. This morning, we're going to look at a couple of disciples who, uh, they didn't have the answers. Uh, They were suffering confusion. They were suffering uncertainty, much like we are right now. And even though Jesus' resurrection had taken place, 
Uh, even though they had heard the report about the resurrection, they didn't exactly know what that meant. Uh, so there was some confusion that they had. Uh, they didn't understand the significance of the resurrection. This is one of those Bible stories that uh, you wish you could kind of go back and listen in on. There are some stories you want to be able to see and witness. You know, uh, God creating the world. Uh, God parting the Red Sea, uh, allowing the Israelites to pass through. Uh, you want to see David versus Goliath. Uh, wouldn't it be great to be there when the angels announced the birth of Jesus or to see Jesus walking on the water? Well, this is one of those kind of stories, but you just want to hear it. You don't have to see it. You just want to hear this conversation. Uh, so this is uh, two disciples that are walking uh, to the, on the road to Emmaus. This comes from Luke chapter 24. Uh, in Luke chapter 24 is when we hear about the resurrection of Jesus. In Luke chapter 23, Jesus has been crucified. Joseph of Arimathea has requested the body from Pilate. And um, Joseph has, has buried the body of Jesus. In Luke chapter 24, Luke 24 opens with the women coming to the tomb of Jesus. Uh, they are bringing their spices so that they can anoint the body of Jesus, prepare it for long-term burial. And when these women arrive, they find that the stone has been moved. Uh, the tomb is empty. And so there's some confusion. What's going on? Uh, there's two men that show up in dazzling white clothing. Uh, these are angels that have appeared to them. And they remind the women that Jesus had said that he would rise again on the third day. And so they are, this is this reminder that Jesus, what Jesus said is coming true. So the women rush back. They tell the 11 remaining disciples. They tell the other followers who were there in the room gathered with them. And they announce that the tomb is empty. Peter, in his haste, runs to the tomb, and he also discovers the tomb is empty. And in Luke's gospel, that's all that's happened. There's a report of an empty tomb from the women. They see the empty tomb. They, they hear the angels proclaiming that the tomb is empty, and Jesus has risen just as he said that he would. But nobody's seen him. There's been no visual confirmation. And that's where we pick up in Luke chapter 24, starting with verse 13. So let's look at Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 24. Luke chapter 24, 13 through 24. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about these things which had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of these things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all of this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. These two followers of Jesus, they are walking on the road to the town of Emmaus, uh, the most likely explanation is that they lived in this town of Emmaus, uh, so they were returning home. Uh, in verse 18, we learned that one of the disciples or one of these followers is named Cleopas. Uh, the other follower of Jesus is not named. Uh, Cleopas is not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. This is the only time that he is mentioned, and so we don't even know the name of his companion who was with him. Uh, this could be his wife. It could be another follower of Jesus who was just curious as to what's going on. 
uh, we really don't know who this other follower is. I, I find it interesting that on the day of his resurrection, on the day that he comes back from the dead, Jesus appears to two obscure followers of that are two obscure people who are following him. Uh, Jesus could have appeared to the 11 disciples and those others who were gathered there in the room uh, with, along with the women who had gone to the tomb. Jesus could have appeared to them. But instead, Jesus shows up to these two people that we really don't know anything about. Uh, these are two people who are leaving Jerusalem. They're not even staying there to hear what the reports are. They're leaving Jerusalem. These two obviously had known Jesus at, on some level. Uh, they thought he was a prophet. Uh, they knew that he worked miracles. They knew that the religious leaders were against Jesus. Uh, they knew that Jesus had great teaching. Uh, but then in verse 21, they say, we were hoping that he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. And so they had this idea of who Jesus was. They had a plan for how Jesus was supposed to save Israel. And back in verse 16, we see that their eyes had been closed, that uh, they were not able to recognize that this was Jesus who was traveling with them. Uh, so it seems not only is there a physical blindness to not be able to recognize that this is Jesus, there's also a spiritual blindness. They could not recognize what Jesus came to do. They're going back, back home, uh, back to Emmaus. Is it because Jesus didn't meet their expectations? Uh, maybe they thought that the Messiah was supposed to do this one thing. Jesus didn't do that, and so we'll go back home. We've given up. They didn't, Jesus didn't do what we thought he should have done. And we're often like that as well. We have an idea of, well, this is how God should work. This is what God should be doing. And then when God does something different, something that we're really not anticipating, do we kind of question God? You know, do we say, well, I'm just going to give up on this for right now. And, you know, maybe God will do something different in another time. So maybe we start to question, you know, why is it that we are here for this Resurrection Sunday when we can celebrate Jesus, but yet there's nobody here? There's nobody in this church building. It's because the church members, the, member, the people of the church are in their own homes. And so we can't gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Do we start to question God? What are you doing in the midst of this? Do we start to question God when maybe we've been praying for a family member to be saved and it hasn't happened? It's like, God, when are you going to answer this question? So we have these expectations for how God is supposed to work. Maybe we have a physical illness and we're questioning, God, why did you give me this? Why is this happening? Are we tempted to give up at that point? There's a lot of people who are losing their jobs during this time. And maybe there's some economic stress going, God, why am I losing my, why did I lose my job? I need a job now more than ever. And are we giving up on God? Are we turning our backs and, and going away because of that? Right now, we have questions, we have doubts. And many of these questions, these doubts come because God did not meet the expectations that we had for God. And so we think God should do this, and he doesn't. And so our doubts begin to increase. That's these travelers, they have doubts. We were hoping, we were hoping that he would be the one that would redeem Israel. Is this why Jesus appeared to them? Did Jesus appear to them to answer their doubts, to help them understand God's plan? This is uh, just my speculation, but I can't help but think this is why Jesus showed up. Jesus is leaving the 99 to go after the one. He could have appeared to the apostles. He could have appeared to the women. But instead, he goes after these two that we don't know anything about. This is Jesus bringing them into an understanding of who he is. Right now, their eyes are blinded. They cannot see that this is Jesus. Jesus who is right in front of them. They don't recognize that. God has hidden this from them. And they're talking to each other. And then Jesus shows up. And they're talking to Jesus about Jesus. 
Jesus pretends he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know the news that's been happening in Jerusalem. And they are shocked that Jesus doesn't know these things. And so uh, it even shocks them to the point in verse 17 where they, they stand still. They're, they're no longer traveling. They stand still. They stop. And they are sad because Jesus hasn't heard this news in Jerusalem. And so they looked and say, how can this man not have heard these things? Uh, and so they're trying to explain to Jesus what Jesus endured. And so this is kind of where I want to see, uh, you know, just be listening. How would you explain to Jesus what Jesus endured? And that's what these people are trying to, to share with Jesus. Uh, they're trying to explain uh, who Jesus is, and they're trying to explain the hopes that they had and, and the hopes they had put upon Jesus the one who was supposed to be the Messiah, who was going to redeem Israel. And Jesus has to correct their thinking. Uh, this is, again, the part where I wish I could listen in and just hear Jesus' response to them. Uh, so this is Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27. Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Jesus rebukes them. He calls them foolish and slow of heart. These two travelers had one idea that they had for the Messiah. And Jesus tells them that their idea for the Messiah is completely wrong. Uh, they read the prophets wrong. They were anticipating a political Messiah, someone who would come and rescue Israel to give them the, the political status, make them a new free nation. And Jesus tells them that the Messiah had to die, that the Messiah, it was necessary for him to die. And so again, that verse 27 is the part that I would love to hear, to hear Jesus Go back to the Old Testament and show them how the Old Testament points to Jesus. So to hear Jesus explain Jesus from the Old Testament, that would just be a beautiful time to hear Jesus uh, explaining all of God's purpose and God's plan for him, uh, God's plan of redemption. Uh, that would just be uh, something that you would want to hear time and time again. This teaching that Jesus has it's for two unknown followers. Don't know anything else about them other than this story right here. They were followers who may have been on the fence. They were potentially giving up. Uh, they were going home. Uh, they were leaving Jerusalem after the report of the resurrection. They even heard the report that the tomb is empty. The angels had said, he is alive. And yet they're going home. They're going back. Jesus comes to them and he takes the time to explain here is God's plan of salvation. Here's how God showed his plan in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, and pointed to the Messiah. In Bethel through the Bible, we have seen how God does have a plan. Uh, all of the Old Testament is pointing to Christ. All of the Old Testament is looking forward to the Messiah's coming. And so the Old Testament is giving us prophecy after prophecy, sharing this is how you will know the Messiah. And we see in the Old Testament how uh, the Messiah is supposed to rescue Israel, but not just Israel, but for all people. These travelers were looking for, again, a political Messiah. And we see from Scripture that the Messiah did come to redeem Israel. The Messiah did come for Israel, but the Messiah came not just for Israel. He came for anyone who would believe, who would put their faith in him. He came to redeem them not from Rome, but he came to redeem them from sin. And so verses 17 and 18, these travelers are amazed at Jesus' ignorance. Uh, he doesn't know uh, what's going on, and Jesus' ignorance leaves them sad. But in reality, the travelers are the ones who have the ignorance. They are the ones who are far more ignorant than Jesus. And Jesus has to explain everything to them. God's story of redemption 
is something far greater than we could have ever imagined. It's far greater than the disciples thought it would be. It's far greater than these two followers of Jesus thought it would be. The, the, the story of redemption is far greater than we can even imagine. Even looking back now, we look back and say, this is so much more than I could have ever anticipated. And so God in the Old Testament is giving us these piece by piece uh, stories. He's given us these glimpses of what the Messiah is going to do. And then here is the fulfillment of that story. Jesus is crucified, he is buried, and he is back from the dead. He is resurrected. Uh, so the New Testament looks back on all of what happened in the life of Jesus. And we see where uh, people are resistant to what God is doing. In the Old Testament, people are resisting what God is doing. They're pursuing these other gods, these false gods. They are continuing to sin. And then even in the New Testament, we see where God has acted out his story. The, the story is fulfilled. The Messiah is dead and he is alive again. And yet these two followers of Jesus, they don't understand. They didn't quite get the full picture. And so they still think they have an idea of the Messiah, but Jesus has to explain the Messiah to them. So even though these followers are resistant, they think they have the idea, Jesus is able to explain to them more about God's story and God's plan of redemption. What Jesus does is he points them back to the truth. He takes them back to Scripture. He points them back to Scripture so that they can see God's plan. That's what's so exciting about people buying Bibles and reading Bibles right now. Because they can hear, they can read for themselves God's story and God's plan of redemption. So as these two followers are, are continuing on their journey, they are going to invite Jesus to, to stay with them, to eat with them. And it is only then, when they are eating the meal, that they recognize who Jesus is. Their eyes are opened and they recognize Jesus for who he is. Look at verses 30 through 35. So Luke chapter 24, verses 30 through 35. And when he had reclined at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us? as he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us. And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. That's what the, that group was telling to the, these two followers. And then these two followers began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. These two followers are changed. They recognize Jesus. They say that their hearts burned within them. And while they're traveling back home, they hear Jesus teach and they recognize Jesus and they immediately have to turn around. They have to go back to Jerusalem. They have to share what they heard and what they learned. When you encounter the resurrected Jesus, your life changes. It will never be the same. You cannot encounter the resurrected Jesus and say, that was nice. Glad that happened. So anyone who encounters the resurrected Jesus experiences life change. So when you think back in your encounter with the resurrected Jesus, how has your life changed? If you think back and say, I can't think of any way that my life has changed, then you have to look more. You have to see more of what Christ has done for you. You have to question, did I really meet Jesus? If my life hasn't changed since meeting Jesus, did I really meet him? Did I allow him to change my life? Did I make him the Lord of my life? These two followers knew some facts about Jesus. They knew that he was doing miracles. They knew that he was a good teacher. Uh, they knew that the, the religious leaders were against him. They thought he was a prophet, but they didn't really know the resurrected Jesus. It's when they encountered the resurrected Jesus that their life changed. And they had an immediate change in their behavior. They went back to Jerusalem. So how has your life changed 
since meeting Christ? Is your life more than just knowing facts about Jesus? These two followers knew facts about Jesus. Is your life more than knowing facts about Jesus? Is Jesus the true Lord of your life? Jesus is the only person to come back from the dead and to still be alive. There are others who had a resurrection. You know, Lazarus uh, is one who had a resurrection, but he died again. But Jesus is still alive. And that's why on Resurrection Sunday, we say he is risen. It's not he has risen or he was risen. It is he is risen because he is still alive and he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Today, if you have not encountered the resurrection, resurrected Jesus, today, will you give your life to him? Will you allow him to change your life? When you do, when you give your life to Jesus, he will take away your sin. All of your offenses against the holy God, Jesus will take those away and you will receive forgiveness. What we recognize is that Jesus on the cross died for my sin, for your sin. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. And because of his resurrection, we know that we can have the promise of eternal life. The redemption of Israel is that, that these travelers wanted was political, but God knew that their need for redemption was far more than just politics. Their need for redemption was to have their sin wiped away to be completely forgiven of all of their offenses against a holy God. That is our need as well. We need spiritual redemption. We must have our sin removed. For Christians, even once our sin is removed, we know that the gospel brings continuing changes to us. It's not just a static, I made a decision to follow Christ, he's the Lord of my life, and when I'm done, that decision continues to have changes in our life. We continue to be made more and more like Christ. The gospel's power continues to work in our lives. God's story of redemption is not just a one-time purchase, but it is a, a, a story of transformation that continues to happen. And so we submit ourselves to Christ on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. We submit ourselves to to his plan. It's not our plan. It's not our hopes, our, our thoughts, and what we want. It is whatever Christ wants. Not my will, but yours be done. I hope that this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, that you will think about the power of the resurrection, the power of the resurrection to change lives, to change your life. The resurrection changed the life of these two followers of Jesus, and the resurrection is changing our lives as well. So let's pray, asking God just to continue to bring that power of the resurrection, to make that known in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for the resurrected Jesus. We thank you that your plan from the very beginning was to make us redeemed, to redeem us as a people because of the sacrifice of your son. We pray, Father, that this Resurrection Sunday would bring life change to so many. Uh, many people who are questioning, who are doubting what's going on, and uh, just feeling a, a sense of fear and uncertainty, we pray that they would experience the hope and the joy and the life that comes in knowing Christ. We thank you that our sin is removed because of all that Christ has done for us. And we pray that Christians today would just experience a, an even fuller joy, um, knowing that this is Resurrection Sunday, but yet we're not meeting together, but there is still joy in knowing the life that Christ brings. I pray, Father, that you would help us uh, just to uh, not be selfish, to not focus on our ignorance and our plans, but we would be wholly submitted to you. Father, we pray that you would continue to work continue to accomplish your plan so that you bring glory to yourself. And we pray all of these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in and joining us online. Again, we would remind you that if you have any prayer needs, if you have any physical needs, we would love to be able to help you in whatever way we can. You can contact us at help 
at BethelSI.org. That email address again is help at BethelSI.org. Also, if you appreciate these services, we would appreciate your contribution to help us in our giving. Uh, you can donate to us at BethelSI.org slash giving. That address again is BethelSI.org slash giving. And if you have, mail a check, uh, the address will be on the screen as well. You can mail that address, mail that check to us. So thank you again. We are praying for you and praying that God would bring us deliverance from this virus, that we can meet again face-to-face -face very soon. Thank you.